Hi there, naturopathic Dr. Ellie Klein here, and I want to share a presentation that I gave at the CHFA East uh, a few weeks ago, October 2023, and it is about hormones, especially estrogen, or this presentation will be specifically about estrogen. I think there are a lot of uh, misconceptions and misunderstandings about estrogen, its role in health, uh, how or what is the best way to test it. And so this is what this presentation is about. And also, how can we apply natural substances to improve a uh, person's health, uh, typically women, but also men. And you'll see why as I go through the presentation. So let me share uh, the PowerPoint and let's get started. Okay, here we go. So um, basically, it is important to understand how hormones affect uh, our health and learn what we can do to support our health as a result of the effects of hormones on our health. And here's the problem. Uh, when big pharmaceutical companies promoted estrogen uh, as the best thing for health, as well as testosterone, but I'm not gonna talk about testosterone today, it resulted in more sickness uh, rather than more health. They promoted uh, estrogen primarily through the hormone replacement therapy medications and through birth control pills. So let's get into it. So what are the functions of estrogen? Uh, basically it's involved in a few things and I actually have a series of sort of pictograms to, to depict that. So uh, it is involved in development of reproductive organs, primarily in women. Um, it contributes to the shape of women, the white hips, the breasts, and so on. Of course, it uh, contributes to the development of the sexual organs of women, the ovaries, the uterus, and so on. Not alone, not on its own, along with other hormones, but it plays an important role. Having said that, we can also see the effect of estrogen, rising estrogen in aging men as their uh, physical characteristics change, for example, um, developing breasts. And it also involved in um, changing the uter uterus tissue and helping to make it ready for uh, implant, implant implantation of the fertilized egg. So basically to help support the carrying of pregnancy. And so it basically, what does it do? It increases, uh, basically estrogen contributes to swelling. So it makes the uterus swell, more cushy, more, um, and more uh, increases the blood supply to the area and the nerves to the area. So a more hospitable uh, environment for the, the, the egg that is about to be implanted. Now, again, it doesn't do it on its own. It needs help from other hormones, including progesterone. Now, this is a very interesting chart. It shows you the rise in hormones throughout pregnancy. So let's focus on estradiol in blue. You see that it goes continuously up all throughout the pregnancy. And it is measured uh, in the blood as pico picograms per milliliter. So keep that in mind, because you see here that progesterone goes up as well in red, right, all throughout. But progesterone is measured in nanograms per milliliter. And so we'll talk about the relevance of that in a moment. Of course, estrogen supports the division of the cells of the fertilized egg into an embryo, right? That fertilized egg needs to start dividing and later on it has to start differentiating. So estrogen supports that growth and division and the development of the embryo. Now that's fantastic for a developing embryo. That's very much necessary, 
but the vision of cells and the increase in size of tissue is not all that great for us when it comes to cancer and the development of cancer. So as you see throughout the presentation, I make the point that estrogen is a major contributor for cancer for this reason. It promotes the vision and the uh, increase in size of cells and tissues. So is it a female hormone? Uh, perhaps, but uh, when it's in excess, especially when it's not opposed sufficiently enough by progesterone, it opposes well-being. So progesterone is super important for this. And so very often we, we you know, people will study this uh, and especially the change in hormone levels throughout the menstrual cycle, they look at this graph, they often come across this graph and they see the rise in estradiol, which is the dominant estrogen during reproductive years, compared to the rise and fall of progesterone. So there's the assumption that there are about similar levels of estrogen to progesterone. But as I mentioned earlier, the amount of estrogen is measured in picograms per milliliter, and the amount of progesterone is measured in nanogram per milliliter. And the difference between the two is 1,000 fold. So really, at the end of the day, when you look at these numbers, the rise and fall of both of these hormones, you see that they are typically at least 50, up to 100 times more progesterone than estrogen throughout the menstrual cycle at any point all the time. So what does it tell you about estrogen being the female hormone? I'd say progesterone, if anything, is the female hormone. And so we'll explore this even further. So yes, women have 100 to several hundred times more progesterone than estrogen. So what is uh, the problem with testing plasma estrogen and progesterone? This is another thing that we need to unravel here. And it has to do with the accuracy of testing plasma estrogen. Uh, and uh, the problem with this is that plasma levels don't correlate with tissue level. So if someone has a problem that might be attributed to the hormones, to estrogen levels or progesterone levels, but if it is impossible to accurately rely on those levels because the amount in the blood, in the plasma, doesn't correlate to the amount in the tissues, then what's the point of testing plasma levels, right? So this comes from studies such as this one, uh, where they compared plasma levels to the levels of the uterus tissue itself. And basically it says here, neither in these women nor in menstruating women was there a close correlation between tissue and plasma levels, typically, there's a lot, more, a lot more in the tissue than in the plasma anyways. As well as a clinician, when I see increasing estrogen levels in the plasma, I would also consider that perhaps it's being sent away from the tissue because we're, are, especially when steps are taken to optimize the amount of progesterone in the tissue. So uh, there are better ways to evaluate uh, the amount of estrogen or its effect, both actually, in, in the body. And one of the tests that I like is prolactin. Now, this study here talks about you know, effects of aromatase inhibitors and androgen activity on serotonin and behavior in male macaques. So what does <laughs> this have to do? What does do male macaques have to do with estrogen and so on? Um, well, it says here, complete inhibition of aromatase with this drug basically significantly and similarly reduced the um, serotonin prolactin response. And so this, along with other studies you see in the medical literature and scientific literature, uh, basically draw the relationship between aromatase activity and prolactin. Well, what does that mean? Aromatase is an enzyme that converts androgens to estrogen. 
And the more active it is, the more estrogen there is. And so the higher the activity, the more estrogen produced, the higher are the levels of prolactin. And so that way, prolactin levels in the blood are far better indicated. Another misconception is that estrogen levels decline with age, and that's the reason for menopause or its symptoms. Uh, and uh, this is the reason, yes, for the symptoms and associated diseases, symptoms and the diseases that are associated with menopause. And so again, this is, I think, a misconception. Um, and this is an example, a study that sort of exemplifies that. And they looked at elderly women and they saw that the older the woman was, the higher were her estrogen levels. It is true that, you know, there are sort of three main forms of estrogen, estradiol, estron, and estriol. And estradiol is the predominant form in our reproductive years. And estron is the predominant form uh, from menopause onwards. But nonetheless, both estrogen levels and overall levels have increased uh, in this experiment, in this uh, study, I should say, uh, as the women got uh, older. And, and so this might make the case that perhaps counteracting estrogen might be the way to address menopausal women and not flushing them with uh, estrogen replacement therapy. So this study basically suggests that and um, let's see what she says here, the author of the study. Uh, current assumption is that hot flushes are caused by low estrogen in both menopause, perimenopause and menopause. Thus, estrogen therapy would be effective. Uh, previous studies treating perimenopause, perimenopausal hot flushes have not been successful. Uh, so yeah, increasing estrogen doesn't seem to help at all. And in this study, what they did is they gave women 300 milligrams of progesterone, and it seemed to have helped counteract their menopausal and perimenopausal symptoms. So the idea that estrogen declines with age um, due to the atrophy, uh, the increase in size of the uterus and the ovaries, is based on the idea that estrogen is produced only by these tissues and perhaps the adrenal as well. And so um, various studies, especially older studies, have found out that that is not the case. Estrogen is actually made in muscles and fats and bones and skin and so on. Actually, higher estrogen levels are made in the bone are associated with bone loss as well. And this kind of goes back to another presentation I made uh, called Busting the Serotonin Myth. And so just like cortisol and serotonin, it is rather a stress hormone, especially when it's not sufficiently opposed by progesterone. Uh, so this refers to a study, acute stress persistently enhances estrogen levels in female rats. So what else can it do? If it's a stress hormone, you might be very well aware of the symptoms, signs and symptoms of stress. What else might uh, excess estrogen to, do to the body? So I'm going to go through a series of different things that it might do and show you studies that support that. I'm not going to dwell over every single slide for uh, any measurable, you know, reasonable amount of time. If you want to look at it, just pause it and, and read it, and then you can actually copy the information and look up the study yourself. So let's go through it. So uh, it seems to be contributing to heart, contributes to heart disease. Uh, it contributes to... Uh, correlates with breast cancer. Again, breast cancer, DNA damage, which is associated with cancer, acid reflux, which is actually associated. A lot of people think of acid reflux has uh, has to do with the acid base balance in the stomach, stomach, but predominantly has to do with inflammation. So it may very well contribute to inflammation. Uh, contribute to dementia, Alzheimer's, memory loss. Again, memory loss. Staying with the brain and the nervous system, excess estrogen may contribute to depression, to uh, addictions uh, and mood disorders. And in fact, progesterone might do the opposite. So you can pause this and read this very interesting uh, animal study. And uh, again, 
Uh, this is an extension of what I shared before, but estrogen's um, influence on addictive behavior and progesterone counteracting that. Uh, staying with the nervous system, epilepsy seizures, and there is data to suggest that progesterone can counteract epilepsy seizures. Migraines, which again can be potentially opposed by enough progesterone, uh, and progesterone like substances promotes autism. And, um, you know, in, in, our, uh, in our area, in our industry, we're very sensitive to the potential effect of childhood vaccinations on autism. Uh, and administering that can be very stressful to the system. So again, makes, there's the connection there between increasing stress, increasing estrogen, contributing to the increase in estrogen potentially. And this study specifically looks at the effect of estrogen specifically higher maternal estrogen associated with, um, with, with increase in uh, autism. So that, of course, happens pre, uh, uh, before the birth itself, so before administration of any vaccinations. Uh, endometriosis, uh, again, an inflammatory condition, so it so shows the relationship between estrogen and inflammation. Uh, PCOS and obesity. Often, this is attributed to higher testosterone levels, but estrogen is produced from testosterone as well. So if there is, again, increased, remember what I, the enzyme I mentioned earlier, aromatase, if there's an increased aromatase activity, uh, then that would result in more estrogen. Uh, same with acne, again, often attributed to testosterone, but again, it seems that it's the aromatization of testosterone and dihydrotestosterone that may contribute, more likely to contribute to this aromatization into estrogen. Suppresses immunity, we know stress suppresses immunity. Uh, varicose veins, so again, affects circulation, contribute to blood clots as well, actually, and obesity as well, obesity as well. Uh, and it's also uh, worthwhile to be aware of the effect of estrogen in men, especially in aging men. Uh, so it can contribute, as I showed you before, to increase in size of breasts in men and also to the size of prostate. In fact, I would argue, uh, based on what I've read, this is the primary reason for benign prostatic hyperplasia, for the increase in the size of the prostate, which would cause urinary issues, frequency, um, incomplete voiding, and so on. And so, uh, yeah, affects the prostate, uh, gynecomastia, which is increasing breast size, may contribute to infertility and erectile dysfunction as well, which also tends to be more common as we get older. Of course, the rise in estrogen in men tends to increase as we get older. And I just wanted to then uh, bring this to your attention. Uh, this is the basis for, some of you are familiar with this product, Easy Peasy, uh, formulation of mine to, for prostate support for BPH. And that's the idea behind the formulation. The ingredients were selected based on the idea that it's, it is estrogen that causes the swelling of the prostate. Uh, so stinging nettles and beta cytosterols counteract the effect of estrogen. Vitamin E and selenium act as aromatase inhibitors. Uh, inhibit the conversion of androgen to estrogen. There's another uh, more, uh, I'm not sure if it's less common, but probably uh, less powerful effect, but still an important effect. And there are studies on this. Uh, and it is the effect of gut inflammation. Uh, particularly bacterial byproducts on an, as, as endotoxin that leak through or penetrate uh, the circulation through the gut when there is a leaky gut situation and they end up interacting with different tissues, including the prostate, contributing to uh, inflammation as well, and therefore increase in size and so on. So that's why uh, there are these ingredients as well, B2 and epigen and, and pause this and read about this as well. Um, so what promotes the increase in estrogen level? It's valuable to understand that. We know what it is that we hopefully can oppose that. And we can use natural health products to do that as well. 
So basically things that promote uh, increase in estrogen are stress, low thyroid hormone, PUFA stands for polyunsaturated fatty acids. So the omega-6s, I would argue the omega-3s too, but basically any type of polyunsaturated fatty acid um, has estrogenic type of properties. Uh, very destructive. There are a lot of double bonds in there and can easily peroxidize and uh, act like or influence the uh, balance of estrogen in the system, the production of estrogen. Plastic as well, uh, BPA and so on. Other environmental toxins, alcohol can increase estrogen and certain nutritional deficiencies, which I'll go over. Progesterone opposes the estrogen and the health issues um, that, that occur by unopposed estrogen. And so the things that decrease estrogen and therefore support progesterone as well, directly and indirectly, uh, including some natural agents, well, they're pregnenolone, which is the main master steroid hormone that is made from cholesterol, and progesterone, which is made from pregnenolone and cholesterol, and uh, stearic acid, which is the uh, uh, fatty acid, saturated fatty acid you find in coconuts, uh, in cacao as well, uh, very common cacao, in beef fat, uh, helping to, supporting the elimination of estrogen through the liver would help reduce estrogen levels. And so vitamin B1 and B2 support that, as well as the fat-soluble vitamins, K2, uh, D, uh, and so on. Uh, niacinamide supports that as well, supports B1 and B2. Um, methylene blue is a, a non-natural substance, can help with that as well. Having enough calcium and selenium, selenium being an aromatase inhibitor, calcium itself uh, has, gotten a bit, has gotten a bit of a better reputation in our, in our industry, but sufficiency is important. It's actually an anti-stress mineral, much like magnesium is an anti-stress mineral. Um, vitamin E and A again, aromatase inhibitors, vitamin K2. And now a uh, couple of botanicals, so Vitex, right? Vitex or Chase Tree, um, very good at supporting progesterone levels. And white peony as well, widely, widely used in traditional Chinese medicine, um, are good as well. And really good at supporting increase in progesterone levels. And so that's why those two were chosen to be in this new product that we just launched, Menstrual E. So I'm just briefly showing you what, talking about, so I'm just briefly showing you this product and talking about this um, and the rationale behind the ingredient selection, I actually just went over it. Uh, a lot of these ingredients I just mentioned work towards the reduction of progesterone, uh, the reduction of estrogen and the increase in progesterone. What about, what about adaptogens? Uh, adaptogens we know are helpful to help mediate the effects of stress, decrease stress hormones and so on. And if estrogen is a stress hormones, hormone, could adaptogens help? And I think that they can. Anything that lowers stress and improves mood and energy likely has pro-progesterone hormone and a hormone balancing effect or action. Uh, so there are some suggestions related to the use of ashwagandha in that regard. Uh, and of course, ashwagandha is one of those botanicals that help to lower cortisol as well, as is rhodiola rosea. And um, here I'd like to uh, bring up an example, a testimonial of sorts, uh, that or uh, something that was shared with me by an associate uh, years ago, who for the first uh, time took Roseva, uh, Roseva being our main Rhodiola Rosea supplement. And she shared with me that she was going through menopause at the time that it helped alleviate her vaginal dryness. And at the time, it didn't make sense to me why would an adaptogen such as Rhodiola Rosea do something that sort of hormone balancing substance would help with. And now I guess it makes sense. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to introduce you, take the opportunity then to introduce you to our new formulation, which includes both of those ingredients and others as well. It's a two-in-one supplemental program 
the morning program with Rodiola Roseanne and B Complex to help uh, help the person get up and go, energize both the body and the mind, uh, and support uh, mental acuity and concentration, and while still maintaining, you know, helping someone to be calm, collected, and the ashwagandha and the L-theanine at night, Roseva PM product uh, to help uh, help you just relax into hopefully good, restful, deep sleep. Uh, and all of these agents, Rodiola, Rosé, Ashwagandha, and l theanine help lower cortisol. And as such, I would think that they would also help support lower estrogen relative to progesterone levels and higher progesterone relative to estrogen levels. And uh, also on this note, I'm going to take the opportunity to introduce you to Empower Her, which will come out soon. And that's basically a combination of adaptogens, uh, rhodiola rosea, sabrina ginseng, maca, and horny goat weed, along with a variety, variety of vitamins and minerals to support menopausal fatigue relief. Um, had good feedback uh, with regard to this formulation specifically for extreme fatigue, mental and physical fatigue during menopause. Not so sure whether it will do a lot or hot flushes, but that's not the purpose here. The purpose here is to support the production of energy, delivery and availability of energy for women who are going through menopause. So I think this is pretty much it. I'm not gonna talk about testosterone now. I'm gonna do a separate presentation for that. Uh, appreciate the time you took to watch this. Uh, thank you very much.